there's been a perception change to do that, sorry. So there's been a perception that floods have been widespread and commonplace in, in the UK in, in particular and in Western Europe. To add on top of that, there's been huge economic losses and there are big socio-economic consequences of large flood events. And in Europe in particular, over the last 20 years, they've, been the, they've, they've caused the most economic damage of any other natural disaster. So it does give a bit more impetus to, to studying this area. And there was a recent study, I think in 2011, that showed through multiple climate simulations that with an increase increase in greenhouse gas concentration there was a there was more likelihood that climate change had led to increased risk during the autumn 2000 events so with climate change expected to lead to an enhancement of precipitation extremes it again gives a another reason to be studying these events so what are atmospheric rivers well, they're regions of enhanced moisture transport across the mid-latitudes. So mid-latitudes, we're talking about between 30 degrees north, 60 north, or 30 south and 60 south. They're located within the warm sector of extratropical cyclones. So the storms that we particularly see coming across the North Atlantic Ocean, they're embedded within these storms. They're in the pre-cold frontal region, and they're seen as being a subsection of the broader warm conveyor belt. So the warm conveyor belt is transporting heat and moisture, or the sensible and latent heat fluxes polewards, and the atmospheric river has been defined as the, the narrower region within the low level jet, which is doing most of the moisture transport. And it wasn't until probably the mid 1990s that the accurate satellite retrievals of the integrated water vapor in the atmospheric column really highlighted this region that we now know as the atmospheric river, although back in the 1970s they'd identified a region of high moisture transport. It was uh, particularly the satellite retrievers that identified it to, to more modern researchers, but to more up-to-date researchers. So, um, and then on top of that, after the area had been identified, these regions, these atmospheric rivers, they've been related to heavy rainfall, in particular in Western North America. That's where most of the work has been done throughout the late 1990s, in particular the 2000s, and more recently in South America and, and Europe. So what I want to do is just show firstly a, a more recent, well a very recent event, so during the, the floods of 2012, this is a visible satellite image which you can see of the North Atlantic sector. You can see that a general cloud band moving towards the United Kingdom or in the southwest northeast orientation towards the UK, or towards Western Europe, I should say, but it doesn't really tell you what's happening in the atmosphere, what potential is, what potentially is occurring under, under this cloud band. So if you then have a look at the integrated water vapour, this striking feature comes out, which is the, what has been defined as the atmospheric river. So in this image, this doesn't tell you anything about the transport of the vapour, but this is just telling you exactly where the vapour is lying in the atmosphere, and you can see it in, in the southwest to northeast orientation, basically along along the cold front, and it's right in the pre-cold frontal region. But as I say, this just tells you where the water vapor is. It is, yeah, yeah. Unless you, unless in the reanalysis product, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, so the retrieval, retrieval fails over land. And just one other interesting point on that: it also fails, uh, fails when you've got a rain rate so in the centre of so if there's any areas of rainfall, you end up seeing failures in the retrieval, which are the black areas. Yeah. So yeah. is that the range? Well, it's generally in these features, is, is it, it's, um, it's more statically stable, so you don't always get rainfall within these corridors of vapour transport, or well, this is just the vapour, but um, you'll see it as well in a later figure, that it actually fails in the in areas of, of rain rate. Yeah. And other land, as you, as you said as well. But a more, so this is, as I said, this is just telling you where the actual water vapor is in the atmosphere. A more relevant diagnostic is to actually look at the integrated water vapor transport. So, as you can see in this particular event, you've got this very narrow corridor of air or narrow corridor of vapor transport along that uh, line. So, 
Although if you go back to the last image, it appears that this moisture is being transported all the way along that band. It's actually in a, a finer region where most of the transport is occurring. So this is the this is reanalysis. This is yeah from the NASA Sorry. Yeah. No. 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 problem. The question was about the the integrated water vapor imagery from satellite, and it was just to confirm that we don't get any um, water vapor pollen water vapor from satellite over the land because the retrieval fails over the land. And it also fails where you've got heavy rainfall, which you can see in the black areas over the North Atlantic. And along this moisture plume, you can see there are black areas along there where, where it's failed as well. So after that, I just want to go through, firstly, as I said earlier, start by looking at Europe. This, this is a... It's a very simple tool it's, it's to identify time steps or times, regions of high moisture transport coming into Western Europe. So what we've done here is um, using the ECMWS era interim reanalysis product, we calculate vertically integrated water vapour transport. And what we want to do, we know that extreme vapour transport will be, well, is likely to be related to heavy precipitation and floods. So what we want to do is identify these time steps which are of most relevance to us when these features are occurring. So what we've done here is to consider, obviously as you go from the equator to the pole, you'll end up with varying temperature, which will give you a varying specific humidity or moisture content in the atmosphere. So what, so what we've done is we've created separate vapor transport thresholds in five degree latitude bands up the western boundary of Europe, roughly at 10 degrees west. And in five degree bands, so it's from 35 to 40, 40 to 45, all the way up to 70 north. And we've chosen an extreme integrated vapor transport threshold. It's roughly on the order between 500 and 600 kilograms per meter per second. Um, I won't go through the methodology of how that came about, but that's basically that's considering the most extreme vapor transport event. But furthermore, these atmospheric rivers moisture transports there contained within extratropical cyclones. Now you can get a storm which will move quickly across Western Europe or whatever your relevant region is. If it does that, you may get a, a time of heavy rainfall, but it's not necessarily going to give you a a, um, a large total of rainfall. So what, what you're really looking for here is a persistent atmospheric river. So by that we mean that it Focused, it's focused on a certain region for a prolonged period of time. And in that definition, what we've said is that you need a, one, of, one of these focused moisture transports to be over a region for at least 18 hours, which would be three six hourly time steps in, in the interim <coughs> reanalysis. And you'd also want it to be spatially persistent. So we've said that this intense region cannot move by more than four and a half degrees latitude, which is roughly 500 kilometers over that 18 hour period. So that should deliver enough rainfall to wet up a central catchment and then create a, a flood event after that. But this particular event that you can see here on the screen, this was, I think this was December 1994, which led to a large flood in southwest Scotland. And you can see again this very narrow band of very high moisture transport in a broader region of, of polewood transport, which you could consider as the, the warm conveyor belt. So once you've identified these events, what you want to do is assess what is the impact of these events on the hydrology, in this case, on the annual maximum precipitation across Europe. So what these plots here, if we just look at the left panel, this is from the Ensembles project, the EOB data set, a quarter of a degree resolution daily observed precipitation product across Europe. And these left panels, these basically show what we've done from 1979 to 2011 is that each year pull out the largest rainfall, daily rainfall in each year. And then when you have that, you've got an annual maximum series. And then these left plots will show you in what seasons do those annual maxima occur. 
it's quite striking if you look at Western Europe, in particular for December, January, February, which is the top panel, and September, October, November. Generally, most of the largest rainfall events in Western Europe occur during the, say, the winter half year. So you can see it certainly up the Iberian Peninsula, Western Britain, Western France, and then moving into uh, Norway for December, January, and February. And again, you, still, you get quite a few events in September, October, and November in Western Europe. Interestingly, if you move to Central Europe, most of the events occur in the summer season, June, <coughs> June July, and August, which uh, potentially hint at more of a some kind of convection event, which be leading to the extreme rainfall there. So if you look at the, the white panels of this plot, what we've got is the number of these events these annual matter events which are in the left column that are related to the moisture transport, these atmospheric rivers that we've detected using the algorithm in the in the slide that I presented previously. So what you can see, if we just take an example of Northern France, before, if you have a look at Northern France, you've roughly got about 15, 16 events in Northwestern France, annual maximum precipitation events, which occur in the winter. If you then have a look at the number of those which are related to the atmospheric rivers, which I'll explain how we do that in a second. If you look at the number that are related, you end up with 70 to 80 percent. So you're looking at say, 12 to 13 of the events actually were related to the moisture transports we pulled out in the in the algorithm. So to relate these ARs to the annual maxima, what we've done is you say that the annual maxima must must occur on the day of the atmospheric river or one day after the atmospheric river event. So you're allowing for inland penetration of the moisture transport into Europe. As you move towards the summer season, you can see that there's generally less um, less connection between the ARs and the annual maxima. So generally during the summer time, you end up with a, a weaker storm track, weaker baroclinic zone across the North Atlantic. So you, basically the extratropical cyclones and their embedded Atmospheric rivers would be less commonplace, so you end up with a, a weaker link. Can you just step back to the definition? Yes, yeah, back to the definition. No problem. Yeah. That to this definition. Yeah. So we're just stepping back a slide to the definition of the, the detection algorithm. So you, yeah, so you
the ARs and the annual maxima are where you've got um, mountains where you've got orographies, which is, which is causing the uplift within this moisture transport and then creating the, the large rainfall turbines that follow after that, which will come up even better in the next slide, which I'm just going to move on to. So to try and highlight this link even, even more so, out of these annual maxima theories at each grid point, if we have a look at the top 10 annual maxima events, and then see how many of these events were caused by these moisture transports that we pulled out, you'll find large, quite large regions with certainly six, seven, and eight out of 10 of their events caused by these ARs over Spain and Portugal, northern France, western Britain, and then moving up into well, even in the, in the low countries and up into Scandinavia as well. And these generally follow, even, even though these regions in northern France and, and Benelux, they're not very high mountains, you can see the effect of orography on the on these extreme events. They basically tra they're tracking the, the mountains across Europe. And in particular, if you look at um, Western, Scot well, Western Scotland, parts of England, Northern France and Norway, eight of the top ten events were caused by these ARs that we've identified. So there's a, a very strong connection there. And as I say, these are the most extreme events that we're pulling out. Extreme atmospheric rivers we're pulling out. So <coughs> even with these, these extremes, which are relatively few events, they're capturing the majority of the extreme precipitation. So what are the patterns, the, the atmospheric patterns, composite patterns that are related to, to these atmospheric rivers that are affecting different parts of Europe? What you've got here going across the screen, top left we've got from to southern Europe, 35 to 40 north. As you track through, we end up going to northern Europe, 65 to 70 north. What you can see is the blue regions are the negative anomalies, red regions are the positive composite anomalies. So what we've done, just to go through the methodology, for each atmospheric river event that you've got, we'll calculate the average pressure over that time, over that event. We'll then create the anomaly pattern of that event with respect to the same time period over the years 1979 to 2011. And we'll then bin these anomaly patterns in these five degree latitude bends right at the western seaboard of Europe. And if you take a composite mean of that anomaly pattern, you can get an idea of what pressure setup, what pressure pattern, atmospheric pattern is causing or is behind those events, I should say. So if you first start off in southern Europe between 35 and 40 north, you can see there's a large low pressure area or area of lower than normal mean sea level pressure anomaly being located generally from Britain right the way down to down to Spain. And then there you've got the red area, which are the positive pressure anomalies located over Greenland and Iceland. This would relate to a more of a negative North Atlantic oscillation pattern with a blocked flow, a blocked flow over Northern Europe and um, a storm track affecting Southern Europe with the embedded atmospheric rivers and heavy precip hitting Southern Europe. As you move towards Northern Europe, so you get towards 45 to 50 north, 50 to 55, you end up with almost a, a classic NAO, North Atlantic Oscillation pattern between the Azores and, and Iceland. And then again, as you start moving further north, you end up with this dipole pattern between the pressure anomalies. I must stress that they're not necessarily in the same locations as would be used in the traditional North Atlantic Oscillation pattern. So you're, you're picking out the most relevant areas that across Europe that are related to these atmospheric river events. So it, it just highlights quite nicely the shift in patterns as you go across across Europe. So moving on, I'd like to just so moving on from the from Europe in general and just to focus on on some British winter flood events. So the first thing is We've gone from studying the whole year in over Europe, and now I'm going to focus on the winter. I'd just like to show one reason why we decided to focus on Europe. These, these panels are nine river basins. These are actually down the western side of Britain, but it generally holds across the UK as well. What we've got here, like before, we've taken out, we've got the flood record 
we've got the, the daily river flow time series for these nine river basins. What we've done for each year, this is the water year now, so this is from October one year until September the next year, we've taken out the, the largest flow within that year, which is the black line, which you can't really see, but I'll explain why in a moment. And we've also taken out the, the largest flow within the winter period, which is from October to March. So what you can see here is that the blue line, which is what we call the winter maximum series, is basically the same as the black line, which is the annual maximum series. So the blue line is superimposed on the black line. There are a few regions, in panel, there's one in panel A, one in panel E, I'm sure there's one in panel C as well, where the annual maxima is larger than the winter maxima, which would suggest that the, the largest flows occurred in the summer. But generally, the winter floods are the largest in these catchments, and this generally holds across Britain. So as they're generally equivalent, we've focused on the winter floods for the, for the next part of this presentation and for the part, and for the research as well. So what we did here is, for, for this particular study, we selected four river basins across, across Britain. Crudely, it captures the precipitation gradient, rainfall gradient across, across Britain from west to east and from south to north. And it also considers different geologies. So if, you, if you've got impermeable geologies, which you have in the west, you'll generally get a quicker runoff response. The one river basin we've got here, which is the Lambourne, it's a, a chalky catchment, it's very permeable, you'd expect a more of a lagged runoff response to rainfall. So it was just, it's to have a range of hydrogeological properties, that was the, the reason to select in the, the river basins. So what we've done here over 1970 to 2010 is identify the winter flood events using this winter maximum series. So from, so it would be say October 1980 to October 1970 to um, March 1971, you pull out the maximum event, and you do that for all the winter, winter days after that. And then what we've, winter years after that, sorry. So what we've done with those then, once we've identified this winter maximum series, is have a look at what actually occurred before these events in terms of the specific humidity patterns, wind fields, satellite retrievals, what, what was happening at the same time as, as these flood events. So it's basically a, a, a bottom-up approach, if you like, to you're using the impact to identify what's happening in the atmosphere. So in particular, I want to firstly show, I mentioned this in the, in the background slide. In, in Britain in 2009, November 2009, there was a quite a severe flood event in the northwest of England, which we had our largest daily rainfall total. I think it was 322 millimetres, I think, in the 24 hour period. So th this was a setup on the morning of this event. You, you had a low pressure to the south of Iceland and the broad high pressure over, over Europe. And within this region, this is the low level 900 millibar specific humidity. You ended up with a, a very moist <coughs> air mass, which manifested itself as a warm conveyor belt with a, an atmospheric river within it, which was basically impacting this black dot that you can see on the screen, which is the, the Lake District in northwest England. And it was there for a prolonged period of time, which delivered a huge amount of moisture, huge amount of rainfall, and then the resultant floods after that. So th this is the satellite retrieval of the column integrated water vapor, precipitable water at the time of the event. Going back to the, the question that was brought up earlier, you've got the blue region, which in this case is the high um, column water vapor values. The white region embedded within it, this is where there was rainfall at the time, so the retrieval has, has failed in, in there. But you can, you can see that this very fine band, this AR, I'm going to ask you to interpolate between the points, but it is basically hitting the, this area, this catchment, Hang on, which led to the huge rainfall and, and resultant flood. So that was just for one of one event in this particular river basin. This is the, the River Eden in the, in the northwest. So what were the patterns for the largest ten winter floods? Is it a consistent pattern? That's what we were we were looking for. And what you can see from this part, these are the top ten events. This is the event I just showed. So it's actually the fourth largest event for this particular river basin. And what you can see is generally for, for these top 10 events, you end up with a persistent 
moisture field, moisture transport with a southwest northeast orientation towards the, the River Eden. So this particular catchment in, in northwest England. So what you can see is this is not just a one-off event. This is a this particular setup is the the cause of the largest event in this river basin, which comes out quite nicely in this pot here. I should say for the other two river basins, there was one in more of the southwest of the UK and one in the northwest of Britain. Similar patterns do come out, although they've got slightly different orientations because the basins are in different locations. If you move to the Permian geology, which I mentioned, this this small catchment in southern England, the Lambourne, you generally need a series of storms. You need more rainfall events to give you a, a flood event. So you, it, it tends to be either a couple of months of prolonged rainfall or a winter rainfall so that you then get the largest flows at the end of the recharge season, which would generally be March, April for, for southern England. So then what was, it, what was the, the atmospheric circulation behind the top 10 events in, in these four river basins? So the, the plots I just showed, the top 10 events, that was for the, the Eden catchment, and this is the, the resultant geopotential field. So this is the 900 millibar geopotential field. And what you can see is you've got a, a lower than normal geopotential to the west of Britain, and to, west of the south of Iceland, higher than normal pressure over Europe, which led to the poleward infection of you know, moisture laden air within the warm sector of storms, and the, the heavy rainfall events that followed after it. If you look at the more northern catchment, so this is in the far northwest of Scotland, there's more of a zonal pattern there, to be honest with you. So it's more of a west-east pattern, but you've still got this dipole of positive and negative anomalies, which you can see in the top right plot. So southwestern England, again, it, this is more of a similar pattern to the Panel A plot in the, the River Eden, so the River Tavy that it's called. Again, you've got this lower than normal geopotential, which is drawing up the, the moisture over the river basin. As I said before, with this Permeable catchment in panel, panel D, the River Lambourne, there is a hint of, during these top 10 events, at, at the time of the event, there's a hint of a lower than normal geopotential across the river basin, across Britain, but the link is far weaker than for the more quickly responding or fast responding catchments in the, in the west, which are the top three, three panels. So these, these relationships between the flood events and Atmospheric rivers are more striking in the fast responding river basins in the west, which is partly, is partly to do with the impairment of geology, steeper slopes, which will lead to a, a quicker runoff. So we've established that there's a, there's a strong link between these events and between the flood events and the, the atmospheric rivers. So what could happen under potential climate change? That's the next. You know, interesting question, what, what could actually occur? So there, there are two things in particular that could happen with these moisture transport events. Number one, with the warming atmosphere, by, you know, through physical principles, through the clausius clapeyron equation, you would expect at the surface a 7% rise in specific humidity with a one Kelvin degree rise in temperature. So with a warming atmosphere, it's likely that there'll be more water vapor in the atmosphere. So potentially more water vapor could be transported. So you could end up with larger rainfall totals and then in effect larger floods. The other thing which could occur if you end up with a, a change in the large scale circulation pattern to do with the, the storm track changes, you could have a change in the frequency of these events which will then affect the number of extreme precipitation events and number of winter floods after that. So what we've done is a the Climate Model into Comparison Project, Phase 5, the CMIT 5 project has got a, a number of climate model runs. And the first thing to, to have a look at, because of the, you could say, the, the fine structure of these moisture transport events, these atmospheric rivers, can these be picked out within the climate model world, which are on resolutions of 100, 150, 200 kilometers of uh, bridge spacing? So what we've done here, we've selected five client models due to, basically due to availability of a six hourly time resolution <coughs> data set of the humidity and the wind. 
what you can see for these five models, we've got Beijing model, Canadian, French model, GSEL from the US and Norwegian model. What I've just shown here, these are examples of moisture transports which we've detected in these products using a similar algorithm to the one I introduced for Europe. So qualitatively, it just shows you that these events or these types of events can be seen within these client model worlds. So it gives you a bit of confidence that they are producing these events. Just as a comparison, the bottom panel, panel F, that's the 20th century reanalysis. And this is at a two degree by two degree resolution, which is similar to the five models which are presented. And it's just to show that they have a similar type of structure to the reanalysis. So again, it gives you a bit of confidence in these in these models. So this is just a, a if you just focus on the five bar charts here, so panels A to E. There are, in particular, if we just look at the unhatched bars, so the, just the grey bars, there are three different runs here. There's a historical run, which is the far left panel. Second from the left, which is the RCP 4.5, which is a, it's a projection, it's a scenario, which is the representative concentration pathway, which at the end of the 21st century has a increase in relative warming of four and a half degrees watts, four and a half watts per square meter, sorry. And then the second, Bar from the right, which is the RCP85, which is a, a more extreme scenario of 8.5 watts per square meter at the end of the 21st century. So the 4.5 watts per square meter is an intermediate scenario, which is more of a conservative estimate, whereas the RCP85 is a, as a more extreme scenario. So what we've done here is uh, have a look at, for start, have a look at the historical. So this is. Um, so again, this is using an algorithm similar to the one I presented earlier. This is particularly just for Britain, so between 50 and 60 degrees north, at roughly five degrees west, so just basically landfall in Britain. And we're trying to identify the number of atmospheric rivers that you detect in the historical runs. So that when you've identified those in historical runs, you can see as you go to the future, is there an increase in, in these events? in the different scenarios. And what you can see generally across the board, as you go towards the future, so from the historical to the RTP 4.5 to 8.5, you end up with an increasing number of AR, AR events in the future. So just to say one thing on that, the historical runs are, um, are analyzed over 1980 to 2005, and the future runs are at the end of the 21st century. 1974 to 2099. So we're looking at two time cycles <coughs> of 26 years. So as I say, as you can see, as you move towards the future, you end up with an increasing number of events. So what, what could be the reason for this? I mean, there are obviously there are two reasons, and there you could end up with a stronger uh, wind, which is transporting the moisture, which was a question that or comment that came up earlier, or you could end up, with, or you could have larger moisture content in the atmosphere due to an increasing temperature of the atmosphere. So what we've done to try and identify the cause of these changes, if we just look at the bottom right panel, you can see it's panel F, temperature rise in the, in the RCPs. So it's a very simple sensitivity analysis. What you can do is, if you have a look at the North Atlantic sector, which is roughly 20 to 60 north, it's how we defined it, 20 to 60 north, zero to 60 west and the meridian to 60 west. If you have a look at the average temperature, average winter temperature over the 1980s, 2005 period in the historical runs, you can then do exactly the same and have a look at the average surface temperature in the future runs and the future scenarios and the RCPs. And what you see from the, as you go from the historical to the RCP runs, you can see the increase in temperature in these five different models in, in panel F. So the, the light grey panel is the, the temperature rise in the RCP 4.5. The darker bar is the temperature rise in the RCP 8.5 run. So with this temperature rise over the North Atlantic, what we've done with it is to scale up the humidity, or scale up specific humidity in the historical runs by the classius clapeyron relationship, which at the surface, and it generally holds throughout the atmosphere, 
is 7% per Kelvin degree rise in temperature. So for example, if you look at actually the Beijing model, it's nearly two, two degree rise from the historical to the RTP 4.5, that far left grain bar, that would roughly equate to a 14% increase in the specific humidity of the historical run. So what you're doing, you're artificially scaling up the historical run to see that is this simple thermodynamic rise in humidity the answer to the increase in the number of AR events that we see in the actual RCP runs. So going back to the bar part, if you have a look at the hatched bars, which are under them are labelled RCP 4.5T and RCP 8.5T, these are the number of AR events that are pulled out using a scaled up historical run based on the temperature rise over the North Atlantic. If you look at just the, the RCP 4.5T run, which is the, the middle hatched bar, there's a pretty good agreement to be honest with you. Most, well certainly mostly, if you look at the Canadian is pretty good, the Norwegian is pretty good as well, and even in the GFTL, there's a, quite a good agreement between the number that you would see in this scaled up run of the historical run and the RCP 4.5 run itself. So a lot of the, we could suggest that a lot of the increase in the number of AR events in the future in this RTP 4.5 run is to do with a simple thermodynamic forcing. This is not to mention that, of course, there could be a, a dynamical change in the storm track across the North Atlantic. We, we fully admit that. And also there's internal variability because we're just looking at the, these two 26 year subsets. I'll just mention, if you look at the RTP 8.5 run, this simple thermodynamic scaling underestimates what you'd expect from the RCP 8.5 run. So if you look at the two right bars of these panels, A to F, A to E, sorry, there is an underestimate there. So there is obviously something else going on as you start moving towards the more extreme scenarios. So I just wanted to to highlight that, that thermodynamic change that we just, I've just spoken about in the last slide. This is just one model in particular. This is a Norwegian model. What we've done here, the big scatter plot, this is a, a scatter plot of the, the black dots of the historical run. And these are the atmospheric rivers that we've pulled out. These are the <coughs> scatter plot of the low level winds versus the specific humidity. So you can see that in the black panel, in the black dot, sorry. The red dots are representative of the RCP 8.5 run, which is the more extreme scenario. And what you really see in this panel, these are for the, say the top events. So if there, just to explain, if there are 200 events in the historical run, we've taken the, the top 200 events in terms of the vapor transport from the, the RCP 8.5 run. And the most interesting thing, if you look at the, the distributions of these, events in terms of their humidity and wind. If you look at the top panel, top panel, sorry, firstly, the red bars represent the RCP 8.5 run, and this is the distribution of the low level winds. The black bars are the historical run. You can see generally there isn't much of a shift in the distribution of, of the low level winds between the historical and the RCP 8.5 runs. If you just solely look at the humidity, the low level humidity of these events, these atmospheric river events, you can see that there's a a distinct shift, an increase in the distribution, and certainly a large shift in the mean of the humidity of these events. So again, this is suggesting that it's more of a thermodynamic response rather than a rather than a dynamic response. And furthermore, if you have a look at uh, a statistic, if you look at the Kolmogorov Smirnov test, you'll find that if you look at the low level winds, between the different runs, there aren't any statistical, significant statistical relationships or changes in these distributions as you go from the past to the future. If you look at the humidity, all of them bar one had a statistically significant shift. And this pattern generally pops out for, for all of these different runs. So if you look at the historical versus RTP 8.5 or historical versus RTP 4.5. That's correct. Yeah, the, the, so that we just had a, a comment about the negative 
correlation between the, the black dots and the red dots that you can see in the panel. So a negative correlation between the wind and the humidity. So what this is suggesting, I think generally in here, I think it was about negative 0.5 correlation, Pearson correlation. So what this will tell you is that if you, with an increasing wind, you can have a lesser humidity and lesser moisture content, and you'll still get a, the same vapor transport and, and vice versa. Yeah, it's just a. So basically, just to wrap up with a few conclusions then on, on what I presented today. But firstly, from the start of the presentation, you can see that atmospheric rivers are related to extreme European precipitation. And by looking at these annual maxima events, some areas had eight out of the top 10 precipitation days caused by these events. For example, there's Scotland, Norway, Northern France as well. But there are broader regions with six and seven out of 10 of their top 10 events, which were caused by these events. As you move down to the, the real impact, the flood events, the largest flood events in a range of basins are related to atmospheric rivers, are caused by these atmospheric rivers. And in particular, I've mentioned the, the Cockerham flood, Northwest England flood in November 2009. And this AR flood link is generally stronger in the western, more impermeable basins where you've got the steeper slopes, impermeable geologies, which lead to a, a faster rainfall runoff response. And then lastly, the, the message really is that according to the latest <coughs> climate change scenarios, the, these moisture transports are expected to increase in intensity and frequency under the current climate change scenarios. And that's uh, all I really wanted to present today. So thank you very much for, for listening. And if you've got any questions, I'd be delighted to try and answer them. Thank you very much, David. Um, I don't know whether we have any questions online. If you unmute your microphone as well to speak. Um, I have one actually to start with. Um, what you've showed mostly is that um, basically you had a flooded wind and you showed the atmospheric river. But is there maybe a case where you have basically a false alarm where you have these atmospheric rivers but no flooding? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Is where you don't 